Hey, good morning, church family. Welcome back to another time together. I'm kind of getting used to this in some way, right? Uh, we had a, a hopefully a great Easter together. Hopefully you had a great time of celebrating the resurrection of our Lord last Sunday. If you didn't get a chance to go back and see our Good Friday video, hey, that's out there as well. You can go to the app, find that link, go to the YouTube, go uh, Facebook. Uh, I would encourage you guys to take advantage of that. We're going to leave uh, some of the notes and devotions up for one more week for that. If you guys want to take advantage of that, you'll see that uh, under sermon notes uh, as well. But we are, for this week, we're going to head back to parables. We're, we're coming close to the end of our study in parables. I know we haven't gone over all the parables. Uh, there's just so many things we could talk about, but we're going to probably draw this to a close pretty soon. So we're going to be back in parables, right, going through parables again this week and next. Got kind of a two-parter series, site. so if you tune in this morning, you got to come back next week and see uh, how it all rounds out and ends. So we are going to be looking again at parables. We're going to be in Luke chapter 15, if you want to start heading that direction, and we are going to take a couple weeks to look at the lost parables, right? Sounds kind of dangerous, but it's not, right? It's actually really good. These are parables that you've probably heard before, and they have amazing hope, right? Uh, there, there's some amazing messages that come out of the lost parables, and I hope that you find great encouragement in them as well. So, we're going to be in Luke chapter 15, talking about kind of these lost parables. And there's a concept, an idea that comes when you talk about lost. Think about lost and found. Uh, and lost and found, maybe it's just me. It almost seems like that's kind of a, a bygone concept. Like I remember as a kid, right, if you lose something, they say, hey, go to the lost and found, right? It's probably, that was your, your great hope. Go to the lost and found, and my, and my you know, precious lost item might be there, and I can retrieve it, right? And that was a, a great day when the lost and found came through for you. And, but anymore, I kind of don't see those as much. And uh, even when I was uh, teaching not too many years ago, we had a lost and found. It was actually kind of a corner of the cafeteria, but it was uh, pretty much all lost and, and no found, right? At the end of the school year, where the teachers would come together, we'd go venture over into that corner of the cafeteria, and there'd be 15 trash bags full of clothes. And uh, if you were missing a textbook, guess what? He was in the lost and found. Lost, but never found because the kids didn't really seem to care. And you come up with weird stuff, you know, like inhalers and, and, and retainers and all these different things. You're like, you know, all these clothes and all these different things. Like, like who's surviving without this stuff, right? Like, why is all this stuff lost? And, and, and why is nobody finding it, right? It almost seems like the concept of going out and, and finding something that is lost is almost something that people don't really consider or even care about as much anymore. And so when we think about these ideas, this concept, these ideas here with the lost parables, the idea that something is, is lost and needs to be found, this is really important for us spiritually. And this is something, again, like concepts and ideas, which we're going to kind of focus on those concepts and ideas this week and focus sort of kind of more on characters next week. But the idea of, of lost and found is something that we, we have to consider, something uh, that really we should find great hope and encouragement in. And hopefully this week as we go through it, it's something that we can uh, consider and reflect on for ourselves as well. So in Luke chapter 15, okay, we're looking at this idea of things that are lost being found. And we have to look at these parables in light of their audience, right? It totally makes sense, right, what Jesus is going to say here because of who he is looking at and who he is saying these things to at that moment, at that point, but also even for us today. The audience is key in understanding what's going on in the lost parables and really in, in all of these parables, right? We've talked about these deep spiritual truths, but they come from simple stories that simple people like you and I are, are meant to understand and be able to grasp and hold on to. So I want to read just that first part of Luke chapter 15, the first couple of verses. This is going to tell us all about our audience, right? And I sit here, an audience of saints and sinners. Those words are going to come up again more uh, kind of next week. We're going to get into the, the third parable, look at the first two parables um, this morning. But the idea of saints and sinners, kind of the dichotomy, right, of the audience that Jesus is talking to. And so Luke chapter 15, the first two verses you see there on the screen, says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him, to hear him. And, and the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners, and he eats with them. Uh, and so here you have the audience. Okay? And, and, and as the Pharisees point out, you've got You've got sinners, and you've got tax collectors, and then Jesus is hanging out with these people. And we might look at that today and say, well, these are, these are lost people, 
people who are, are lost in their sins, right? And so we use that kind of terminology, the idea of something being lost. Jesus is hanging out with lost people. And the Pharisees are kind of indignant about this. How dare he hang out and even you know, share a meal with lost people? And so this is his audience. This is who he's going to be talking, uh, talking to. And the other side of that coin from the lost people are these Pharisees who, who make it a point to say, listen, those are you know, the unworthy people. Those are the bad people. Those are the people who aren't good like we're good. These are people who aren't going to heaven like we're going to heaven. Right? These are others, okay? and we're separated out. We're over here. We are really, in effect, we're better than they are. So Jesus has both of these groups in his audience, and he's going to deal with both of these groups through these parables. And he has a message, he has a story for each of them, which is, is great how he wraps these parables around his entire audience, right? There's something in there for everyone. And so you look at the subject of these parables, you kind of like, what is the main topic, right? And that's the idea for today. We're going to grab some concepts out of these. And really what you're looking at is you're looking at lost souls being recovered, right? Uh, lost souls being reconciled. You're looking at uh, the story of redemption. That really is kind of the key, right? In, in, the, in the thread that holds all this together, that's really kind of what we get to. But even inside of that, we're going to see some other really important concepts that I want to talk about this morning as well. Uh, we're going to talk about things like uh, you know, the, the foundness, I know that's not a word, right? But the foundness of people who are lost and really kind of what that means to be found and what goes into being found. And then the intrinsic value. And I think that's a word that gets lost a lot today. But for people in culture and society, uh, your worth, right, your value, we tie that things to like self-esteem and stuff like that. Uh, it, that's a big, that's a heavy thing. It's a heavy subject, heavy topic. And it's something a lot of people struggle with. I think a lot of people, and even in Jesus' day, they struggle with the idea of their own self-worth. That anyone would think enough of me to pursue me, to know me, to love me, whatever that might be. And we see even today this, this, uh, this huge weight, right? And it's almost this affliction in our society and culture of things like depression, right? And this low self-esteem and this idea of, of, of zero and low self-worth. But, but Jesus is going to address that in these parables as well. And again, he's addressing it because of his audience. Now, when I sit in my office and I think of these things, right, and, and kind of have one thought, Right? And, and so I'm thinking about lostness, and I'm thinking about who Jesus is addressing, what he's trying to address. And, and that thought leads to other things, thinking about, again, our value and things like that. And then you start putting these thoughts together, and then it's like kind of one train car to the next. And all of a sudden, you have this, this full-on you know, train, uh, you know, train of thought that's, that's steaming down the tracks. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, like, it gets derailed. Do you ever have those moments where you think it, you're putting things together and it all makes sense? And, and then, then there's this big explosion, and you, and you kind of look up in the, in the, in the you know, recesses of your mind, and, and you've wandered off, right? Uh, I did that this week, okay? So, so here's, here's something that came to mind. Stay with me for a moment. Because I think it applies here, so maybe my wandering in, in my mind's wilderness will make sense here in a minute. But I thought of a book from my childhood. The book's called Not Now, Bernard. All right. Uh, now, if any of my family's watching this, if my parents are watching this, uh, you're probably looking at this. You maybe you're chuckling. Oh, I remember that book, right? And maybe you're a little concerned about what, what we're going to talk about because this book I remember it vividly, and I remember as a kid enjoying it, but. But now that I think about it, uh, it kind of like makes me lay awake at night going, why? Right? So, so let me tell you about this book real quick. And I have a link uh, in the sermon notes if you want to go and, um, and, and, and watch someone read this book. It's a British guy, so he, he doesn't use real you know, American English, right? He calls him Bernard or something like that. It's Bernard because we're Americans, right? And we speak that way. So, but he reads this book to you. And so I'm going to give you the gist of the book. And maybe you'll, maybe you'll follow this derailed train of thought that I have. But it's, it's about a boy, right? Bernard. And he starts out, uh, and he's outside. Uh, and he, he goes up to his dad, right? And he's like, you know, Dad, I've, I've got something to tell you, right? And so his dad's hammering something. And his dad loses his train of thought. And he hits his finger. And he screams, not now, Bernard, right? And so Bernard's like, okay. Goes inside, finds his mom. His mom's in the kitchen. I think she's making dinner or painting or something. And, and he's like, Mom, I've got something i got to tell you. And she's like, not now, Bernard. He goes, but there's, there's a monster in the garden, and he wants to eat me. And the mom says, not now, Bernard. So Bernard, not being obviously the most bright child, and I guess maybe we could see why, because his parents haven't taken the time to educate him, he goes to the garden where there's a monster waiting to eat him. And guess what? 
the monster eats Bernard. All right, just gobbles him up. So then the monster, after eating Bernard, goes into the house, goes up to the mother. Right, she's still cooking or paying whatever it is she's doing, and he lets out this big growl. All right, and the mom goes, not now, Bernard. So the monster, kind of confused, walks into the living room. The father's sitting there now. He's reading his paper, walks up to the father, bites him on the leg. Now you're thinking, bites him on the leg? Well, if you've got kids, you can understand how being bitten randomly while you're not paying attention, totally feasible, right? And so monster bites the dad on the leg. He's reading the paper. He screams, not now, Bernard. Mom comes in and says, hey, it's time for dinner. So the monster goes to the table. Monster eats dinner with him. Monster watches some TV. Monster plays with toys and reads a comic book. And then, hey, Bernard, it's time for bed. So the monster walks upstairs and goes in bed. Mom reaches in to turn off the light, and he says, but I'm not Bernard. I'm a monster. In the last part of the book, Mom says, not now, Bernard. Turns the light off, walks out, and that's the end of the book. Now you guys know why I am the way I am. It scarred me for life, right? But uh, thinking about that story, why did I tell you that story? Right? Deep thoughts about lostness, deep thoughts about isolation, deep thoughts about our worth and our value. You get a story like that, and, and maybe we can identify with Bernard at different times, maybe different seasons of our life, where it seemed like no one really paid attention to us. It seemed like there was things kind of waiting and crouching to destroy us, and there's no help. Right? Maybe, again, we, we felt kind of lost. We don't know which direction to go. We don't know who to go to. We don't know how to get out of the situation that we're in. Right? Probably at some point in our lives, we've all felt like Bernard. And maybe the fear is, is that like Bernard, we're going to get eaten up and consumed. There'll be nothing left of us. And nobody will care. Nobody will notice. And, and again, as we get to these parables, when you think about the audience, the Pharisees were convinced they got it all figured out. They don't need to be found because they're not lost. But they look at the other people and say, but they are. They're, they're not the right kind of people. They're not the good kind of people. They deserve to be shunned. They deserve to be whatever that is. Fill in that blank, whatever word you might be feeling, you know, depressed, isolated, whatever that is. And so Jesus is going to tell some parables that's going to speak to everyone. Right? And, and there's some amazing, again, hope inside of these parables. So I hope you catch it, and I hope you can run with it this morning. And I hope none of us have to feel like Bernard from the story, right? So let's jump in. Let's go ahead and read both these parables and let's pick apart the first two parables together. So Luke chapter 15, right? We'll go ahead and start in verse 3 and we'll read through verse 10. It says, So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search it carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And so let's talk real quick about how only the lost can be found. Only the lost can be found. Again, we're keeping in mind the audience, and we're kind of trying to pick up the concepts of what Jesus is teaching, what he's trying to show both groups, right? Everyone that's involved, everyone that's drawn near to him to listen to this. And so as you look at these parables, they both have something in common. In both parables, an object is lost. All right? And maybe an oversimplification to state this, you kind of see it there in the title, but only something that is lost can be found. You see it here with the sheep. You see it here with the coin. Both of them were lost, right? And, the, and the, kind of the point, the concept of the story is that that lost item gets found. And, and so then we, we kind of go back to our audience. We go back to ourselves. We go back to our own humanity. And we think about that. Only people who understand that they are lost can truly ever be found. And, and again, maybe that's too simple, but I, I think it's a point that has to be made. And I think, again, Jesus makes that point. Listen, listen, everyone can, should, if they're being honest with themselves, 
identify with this idea, this concept of lostness. And you see there, it says, what man of you, having a hundred sheep if he loses one? Or what woman of you, okay, having ten silver coins if she loses one? As so he's looking at that audience, right? It doesn't matter if it's a tax collector or a Pharisee or a sinner or whatever. He's like, every single one of you know what it's like to lose something, right? And when you lose something, the goal, the object has to be then to, to find it. And the losing and the finding, those are both things that we can identify with. If you have something that's lost and it's found, right, the finding is, is a great thing. It's something to rejoice over. We're going to talk more about that here in just a minute, right? But so regardless of, of who we are and regardless of our, our title or our station in life, all of us can identify with what it's like to be lost, right? And, and we can probably insert other words there as well, things like isolated, you know, depressed, uh, being ignored. Maybe you feel like you're, you're judged. Maybe you kind of feel like you've been put into, into groups, categorized. Maybe you've been eaten by a monster and no one realized it. Maybe not, right? But you've probably all been consumed maybe with sin of some sort, temptation, you know, whatever that is for you. Right? So all of us can identify with lostness. And here's the thing, while we can all identify with lostness, maybe we can't all yet identify with what it's like to be found, but we like that concept. We like that idea. If we lose something that's important to us, we like the idea of it being found. When it comes to us, when it comes to our souls, when it comes to our eternity, right? we can only truly be found and experience foundness. I know that's not a word, we're going to use it. We can only truly experience foundness if we understand that we actually are indeed lost. And again, uh, I think Jesus makes that point to everyone in that group for a reason. For one person in that group, the person that might find themselves in that sinner tax collector, right? This is, this is great encouragement and it's hope. Listen, I do feel lost and I do feel isolated, right? And, and I like the idea of being found, but I've not experienced it. Maybe I can experience that. For someone else in that group, like a Pharisee, maybe it's almost like an insult. I don't need to be found because I'm not lost, right? I'm right where I need to be. I'm right who I need to be. God likes me this way, right? And I'm, and I'm earning my way to heaven. I'm good enough. I don't need to be found because I'm not lost. Here's the amazing great truth. If you hear nothing else this morning, that for all of us who understand that they are lost, if we have not yet experienced what it's like to be found, you can be found this morning, all right? We're going to talk about in just a minute there's someone, there's a God who loves you and is pursuing you. And for everyone who is lost, there is opportunity to be found. And you can have that this morning right, if you would but submit your life to Jesus Christ. We're going to talk more about that. I want you to hold on to that. Let's keep moving forward with that. But we're going to build on that concept of, listen, lost and found, yes. Right? We've experienced lostness. We want that foundness. But the fact that we are lost and being found is going to mean that we have intrinsic value. Uh, and even to build on top of that, the fact that someone values us means there's going to be great joy when we're found. So let's talk about those two concepts as well. Let's talk about the value of the lost. Now, we saw that in verses 4 and 8, right? We talked about this idea of, of things being lost. You know, what man among you and, and what woman who's, who's, who's experienced lostness? Well, you all have. Right? Everyone's experienced lostness, and we know what that's like, and we kind of have to admit to that. We have to own it. But you read the rest of those verses. Let's go back and read those verses, verses 4 and 8 again. It says, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine, right? Leave him in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until what? Until he finds it. And you look at verse 8. It says, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until what? Until she finds it. So they both experience lostness here. But it's an item of great value to them. So it's not just go, oh, we lost it. Hey, we've still got 99. Hey, I've got nine others. No, those items were of great value to them. And so them being in their lost state is not something that they can live with. So what happens? They pursue it. They go after it. They, they want to go find it and reconcile it. And again, we're considering our audience here. You, you've got 
the sinners and tax collectors, right? It, it, maybe we could add some different monikers, some names from, from today's society. If you're thinking about a group of people who are kind of on the down and outs, right? Maybe you think of, uh, you know, addicts and, and felons and convicts, right? You've got people who have broken relationships and you've got people uh, who, who've been rejected in some way by society. And, and they probably don't feel very worthy. They probably don't feel very valuable. In fact, they probably identify more again with the concept of being lost than being found because it feels like people have pushed them away. They're the ones who are low and the ones who are broken. And it even says, right, that, that it says they left the 99 and the other nine coins you know, the lady put down, right? And so you have these other groups of people. What does that mean? We're going to come back to that in a second. But he's going to focus in for those verses on, on the one. On the one sheep and on the one coin. Yeah, we have the 99. Yeah, we have the other nine coins. But when you think about, again, other people who may not find worth in themselves, he says, that one, that one sheep and that one coin, here's what they're worth. They're worth leaving these other groups, right? And this isn't God abandoning people. We'll come back to kind of what these other groups represent here in a minute. But they're worth leaving those other groups to pursue them because they are of such great value. Value to the shepherd and value to that woman who's looking for those coins. Those people who feel like maybe they've been rejected, maybe again in favor of the larger group and the other people they don't fit in with, he says, no, no, you are worth, you have great value. And, and, and you are being pursued so that you too can also be found. And I think, again, that's got to be a great encouragement to those people, people who are struggling even today with things like depression and thoughts of worthlessness. So no, not only are you lost, but there is a God who is pursuing you to find you so that you can experience what it's like to be found and reconciled, not back to society and not to what other people think of you, but reconciled back to the God who made you and who loves you. And I love the reaction. This is one thing also to me that, that kind of solidifies this idea of our value. And when we think about, again, parables, these are stories. So who are the players here? Well, we're the lost items, right? Those who are dead and lost in their sins. And the shepherd and the woman here represent God who is, who is pursuing us with his word and pursuing us through his spirit. Uh, I, I like the language there with, with the woman. She lights a lamp. Where have we heard that before, the, the idea of light and a lamp? That goes back to Jesus coming into the world, meaning the light of men, right? And, and so here again, uh, you have the, this, this, this concept, these ideas of us being pursued and, and God loving us this much. And here's the evidence. Here's, again, a good piece part of the evidence is the reaction when that lost item is found, right? You, you see it in verses 6 and verses 9. They go and they tell everyone about it. They said, listen, I, I found that lost sheep and I found that lost coin. I want you to know how happy I am that they are reconciled back to me and people around them rejoice. And I even think about that for us as Christians. For those of us who are in Christ, who've experienced what it's like to be found, we should be part of that celebration. When, when a lost soul is reconciled back to God, we should be the group that someone comes to and says, this person has been saved. This person has been reconciled back to God. And we rejoice in that. And we understand the value of it. And we help solidify that value to them to go, we know what it's like to be lost and found. And praise God that you too have been found. We have, we have a world that is, that is, is dying you know, in, in, in this concept. They're drowning in this concept. that They are not worth anything. And there's no one out there who loves them. God is desperate for them. And again, to think about his audience and who he's talking to, and, and he's got a Pharisee maybe standing right here, and I think maybe he's got even like a, a harlot standing right next to him. And in the eyes of God, he looks at both those people and says, I love you, and you have great value to me. And, and not one is more valuable than the other. He loves them both and desires both of them to be found and reconciled back to him. And again, I, th I think as Christians, we have a responsibility not to look down on others and, and not to think ourselves better than anyone else because we've already been found Right? But to rejoice and, and to work uh, inside of, of, of that pursuit as well, to be part of the pursuit of lost souls, right? to get the word out there, to share a testimony in the midst of that as well. Every person, every person is a precious treasure to God. He desires for the lost to be found. All right, so point number three. 
Let's look at the joy of a found life. So, so we've looked at this concept again. Uh, we've gone through our, our, our first two concepts here, lostness and foundness. Okay, Got to consider those things. Uh, we looked at uh, our, our next point, right? Uh, looking at, uh, again, the value of the loss. Okay? And then all those things lead up to this. All those things lead up to joy, right? The joy of a found life. And many times we get a glimpse uh, of the inner workings of heaven, it's special. A lot of times with the parables, we get that. Remember, he would say, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like, and he'd tell a parable to tell us what the kingdom of heaven is like. Well, here he's going to tell us in these, these parables, here's a glimpse of what's going on inside of heaven when a lost soul becomes found. We see it in both parables. We're going to zero in here uh, on this first parable. We, we're at verse 6. We're talking about, you know, he goes and he tells all his neighbors and everyone's rejoicing. Everyone's, you know, going crazy, ecstatic. Hey, you, you found this, this lost sheep, right? The lostness becomes foundness, okay? But here in verse 7, he says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over the sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. And the first thing I want to point out here, Right? And so we've talked about, again, lostness and foundness and people rejoicing. As Christians, we should be rejoicing here and now when we see lost souls being reconciled back to Him. But I want you to understand, here's the value that you have before the Father. That every time a lost soul, right? And this is true for you and true for me if we've come to know Him and been found, that we had a party thrown in heaven on our behalf. That when we became found, heaven got rowdy. Right? And they were, they were throwing that party and they were hooping and they're hollering. And this is what gets the heart of God excited to see his people, right? to see his creations, the one that he loves, right? go from being lost to being found. And again, as, as we consider these things, especially our value and our self-worth, when we are tempted to, to, to get into these, these moments of depression and feeling worthless, right? to go back and remember that when I was found, God had all of heaven hooping and hollering on my behalf, that, that my name was on his lips. This is the joy that we can walk in. It's a joy that we can have now, right? As we see God working on our lives, we see God working in the lives of others, but also know that in heaven and eternity to come, that there's going to be an exceeding amount of joy, right, for the souls that have been found. Now, Paired with this, because again, we're considering his audience, and really this probably a lot of it goes to those sinners uh, and the tax collectors, the ones who, who are looking to be found. Okay, listen, there's going to be an extreme amount of joy when you realize there's a God who's pursuing you and loves you and you can be found. But there's that other group too, the ones that think they're okay, the ones that, that hey, I'm not that sinner, I'm not that person. Here's what he says to them. He says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than... Over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Now, who's the person that needs no repentance? Well, it's kind of a, it's kind of a play on words here, right? Because nobody needs no repentance, right? And what's Jesus saying here? He's talking about people who are self-righteous. He's talking about people who don't see themselves as lost. He goes, listen, the people who don't understand their lostness, who don't walk in foundness, right? Who, who don't submit to the idea in, in the fact that there's a God who loves them and is pursuing them, Right? The ones who are self-righteous, like these Pharisees, right? there's no party for them. There, there's no excitement for them. Right? They're not getting the same treatment because they're not submitting their lives to Christ. They're not walking in that lost and found idea. They think they're okay on their own. He goes, that's, that's not what we celebrate, and that's not what I promote. And that's not what heaven is like, and that's not what the kingdom of heaven is about. You don't earn it. Right? You, you don't give it, have it given to you automatically. Right? It's not some inheritance we've talked about before. Hey, you know, we're, we're of Abraham and, and we have the right lineage and stuff. Because that's not how it works. Right? The 99 who think they're okay, there's no party for them. But the one who understood their lostness and was found, that's where the party lies. And even as, as today, as Christians today, as religious people today, we have to be careful. We have to examine ourselves to make sure that we don't fall into the trap of thinking, because I go to church and because I have the big Bible and because I, I know the words, right, that I'm not looking down on others. Right? First of all, I'm not looking at the world and judging them and going, well, they're sinners and they don't belong. God loves every single one of them. But we also can't fool ourselves into thinking that somehow we've earned it. Right? And that we didn't need to be found. We're just naturally good people. There's no party for that. There's no joy for that. There's no pat on the back for that. 
All right? There's only continued lostness in that. And as he makes that point, and I'm sure he's looking at the Pharisees going, listen, there may be a large group of really good people who think they're okay with God, but if they've not been found in their loss, has been rescued from it, there's no party in heaven, no joy, and no eternity for them. Looking at those sinners and looking at those tax collectors, if you know you're broken and you want to be found, there's a way to be found, and it's through Jesus Christ. And he's made that point. He'll make it again. I want to make it one more time before we close our time together, that if you know you're lost, if you know that you are broken and isolated and that sin has separated you from God, I want you to know there's a God who's pursuing you and you can be found this morning. And it's nothing you did. It's nothing you can do. It doesn't matter if you're good or bad. For those of you who might be sitting there thinking, oh, I'm okay with God because I'm a good person. Hey, I'm watching church on live stream, right? It's not about that. It's about being found in your lostness by God who loves you and finds amazing worth and value in you. And there's true joy to be found in that this morning and a true party in heaven, right, with your name all over it, if that's the decision that you come to this morning. So my hope is that you will hear these words of these lost parables, right? There's amazing joy and amazing confidence that we can have in and through Jesus Christ and the work that he wants to do in the lives of lost people. We've got one more parable to come up. Right? That's a parable of the lost son. That's, that's, that's a famous one. That's a good one. We're going to go through that next week together and kind of wrap this up for the lost parables. My hope is this morning that God's word has spoken to you. You can always reach out, contact me if you ever have questions or concerns about anything. I look forward to joining with you guys again next week. Again, as we finish up these lost parables. Love you. Have a great week. If you need anything, make sure you're contacting me, a deacon or the church office. I hope you have a great week. See you next Sunday.